Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It's ineffable. It's hierophanic. It's an axis mundi. It has sacred places and times, faith and doubt, blessings and curses, and joy and elation. It's a road to God. It's baseball. And here to talk baseball and religion is the preeminent theologian in the Church of Baseball, John Sexton. John is the president of New York University and co-author with Thomas Oliphant and Peter Schwartz of Baseball as a Road to God, Seeing Beyond the Game. Before becoming NYU president, John was the university's law school dean. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice Warren Berger and shared the religion department at St. Francis College. I first met John as a freshman in high school more than half a century ago. He is a friend, a mentor, a role model. John. It's great to be with you, Doug. It's always, always great to be with you. So you open the book and we come to a date. And the date is... A sacred date. A, a, excuse me. A sacred date, October 4th, 1955. Ex explain this date. So first, you, you, have to, you have to look at this otherwise perfect set of teeth, and you see that this one right here is chipped, you see. So this was the time, for those that don't know it, uh, you'll remember it, of, of the black leather jacket guys. I and, have one. I, I wore one to work today. Yeah, well, I don't think of you in this way. Oh, okay, but, good. Uh, we, used to call, Different. we used to call those guys the Rocks. Uh-oh. -uh. And my, 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 my best friend, Dougie, and I, were, were the only two Dodger fans in, in, our, in our neighborhood. And uh, here we are, it's the eighth grade, it's 1955, and, and we've had disappointment, 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 disappointment. And if you went back, you know, even to, to I was born in 1942, 1941, so the year before I was born was Dixie Walker. So this is, you know, it's always, there's something that happens that keeps the Dodgers, and the Dodgers had never won the World Series. And each year, they would play the Yankees, it seemed. It wasn't literally true, but, uh, but almost, almost. Every, almost every year they would play the Yankees. And each year in the sixth grade, seventh grade, these guys would get us against the, the wire fence, and, and they would say, okay, it, it, admit it, Berry's better than Campanella. Mantle's better than Snyder. And they'd go down the line. And lineup. all those things were it, true, it, it, by it, the it, way. I just wanted to point it, that out, but go ahead. We were like the Christian martyrs. We would, we would never admit it. They would knock the crap out of us. So they, they, so every, we would get punished every, every, every year for this. So, so now it's the seventh game of the World Series. Baseball still played on grass mm -hmm. and still played during the day. Mm -hmm. and, and usually the nuns would let us listen to the radio because they didn't have radios in the convent. So they, we could bring the Absolutely. radio in, and they would let us listen to the radio. So, so, but we had done, the eighth grade class at St. Francis had done something wrong, and Sister St. James would not let us listen. Oh, to those nuns. Series. See, we, we, we were and able then, to do this game. Yeah, yeah, go yeah, ahead. So, so, so it's, we, we, we're, we're in lockdown. You know, we, we go in to class after oh. lunch, and the series starts. Oh. We come out at 3 o'clock, oh. and we had these big transistor radios. And, and we turn it on, Dougie and I, and it's the seventh inning, and the Dodgers are winning two to nothing. Oh, man, so sick. we can taste it. This is game seven. This oh, is the deciding oh, game. Padres oh, is pitching oh. for the Dodgers. You know, he was a problematic young pitcher, but, but he's pitching. He's pitching well. We dash home to my house. We go down into the basement. Basement that you were in. Oh, no, please. And, I've and seen we go, the shrine. We go, down, we go down into the basement where I have a shrine to Jackie Robinson that's in the, the corner. That's the, and, and, and we, we turn on, place. We turn on the, 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 the radio. It's the ninth inning. Yanks are still up two to nothing. I'm sorry. Like Dodgers, Dodgers, Dodgers are still up. Yanks are up at the plate. Right. Dodgers are still winning two to nothing. So we do what two kids did in those days. We take down a metal crucifix about this big, and we kneel down next to the radio, and we turn the radio on. We're listening, and, and we're praying at the same time, and we're listening, and we're praying. We got this crucifix and dynamic tension between us, and then ground ball to Pee Wee Reese. Right. Fields it, throws to Gil oh. Hodges, final out. Oh. Dodgers have won oh. the first World Series oh. and the only World Series the Brooklyn Dodgers would ever win. Oh. Oh. The only one. And the son of a gun, Dougie, 
exclaims, let's go to crucifix, exclaims, and the head of Christ knocks you off the top of my tooth. This and did it to you. This is my, my stigmata to, the, to, to that sacred day. Okay, before we get into the meaning of this sacred day, seven miles away, a different Dougie is with his father and his brother and his mother watching the same game. And the three of us are Yankee fans, and my mother's a Dodger fan, and we're sick. It's disgusting. It's evil. So that seventh game was hell. So was the sixth game with Sandy Amaros. So don't hand me any of that. So this is the Crusades. This, this is Cortez and the Incas. This is, it depends on which side you're on, right? I want to be Cortez. You know, no no Incas for me. One, one, one person's saint is another person's sinner. Okay. It, you know, Johnny Damon, when, when, when he's playing for the Red Sox, He's evil. Is, is, is a saint to the Red Sox yeah, fans. Yeah, and evil to us. Evil to Yankee of fans. Of course. Yeah, he comes to the Yankee fans. The Red Sox fans put out a T-shirt that says, looks like Judas, throws like, I'm sorry, looks like Jesus, throws throws like, like Mary, Mary. Uh, acts like Judas. Nice. You know, you know so it all depends. Okay, 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 so let's get to the book itself. It's a really interesting combination of religious things philosophy and history and baseball. How do you come to this? And how does this epiphanic moment in, in October of 1955 sort of capture what your, this book is about and the course you teach at NYU is about? Well, uh, you, you have the advantage of knowing the person of whom I'm going to speak. But the, 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 I, I was blessed years before I met you with a man who really formed my professional life and my commitment to, to the vocation of, 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 of teaching and being with students and using education to shape people. And his name was Charlie, the, the, the greatest teacher that I've ever And you went to Charlie's prep. Yes, I went to Brooklyn Prep, right. which we call Charlie's Prep right. because of the influence of him on that wonderful school and community. But in any case, you know, Ch Charlie had a way of looking at things. He would say to us, uh, Think strange, boys. Mm -hmm. You know, he would use oxymoronic teaching. And this, of course, when, when, when I first met you, is the, what you saw me doing with my high school students and, and me. Ulti ultimately with you. But, so in any case, uh, uh, th th there was a, a big event at NYU. And uh, after the event was over, one of the student volunteers walked up to me and he said, you know, I hear you're a big baseball fan. He said, I find the sport utterly boring. Now, most of my ideas mm. professionally, I can trace back to Charlie. This is a moment, I, I can tell you, I, I, I was channeling him, because he had a phrase he would always use when he thought you were just completely off base. And I look at this young man, I even deepened my voice as if the, I, I, you know, I didn't think of Charlie, but I was Charlie for a moment. I said, you are among the unwashed. I said, but if you will allow me to assign you in a directed research 12 books, and you do a paper on each of the 12, by the end of the semester, you will find out that, and I came up with this phrase, baseball is a road to God. So baseball is a road to God 1.0 was, was kind of just Charlie think strange, oxymoronic thinking, get a, get a student to think about something in a way they'd never thought about right. before. 2.0 I began to notice that as we did it, there, 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 there actually were interesting overlaps. The obvious ones like the cathedral and the stadium. Right, and the, right. The, the and Trinity, the priest, right. All the of that right. kind of stuff. But, but, but there was something that went beyond mm -hmm. that, you know, that got deeper in the moments where, you know, William James would say the religious experience is present, but you could feel yourself in certain moments in baseball, father, son frequently, mm -hmm. touching something transcendent. Yep. So that was 2.0. It, it, it kind of began to feel that way. Then 3.0 was, wait a minute, if we concentrate on that experience and get the students to understand that experience and strip their notion of religion, of doctrine mm -hmm. and hierarchy of God. And structure. Well, not necessarily of God, but maybe of the word God, because as, okay. Paul, as Paul Tillich says, if the word gets in the way, it's, the depth, it. it's the depth of being. That you're, but, but get to that experience, okay? Uh, 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 and maybe students it could, could find through baseball a way of looking at religion differently. Mm -hmm. Not because I wanted them to become religious. Right. I just wanted them to expand their way of... And then finally, 4.0, 
which developed kind of towards the end with that one student, but then when 20 were lined up outside my office, mm -hmm. I, I made it a course right. 12 years ago. 4.0 was, wait a minute, the very slowness of baseball, <sighs> but the activity that occurs between the lines, the, the intricacy of it, the, the fact that a 2-1 count with a runner on base is different from a 2-1 count than the first inning with no one on base. Can, can we digress for one yeah, second? Yeah, yeah. One of my pet peeves is you can't watch a ma Major League Baseball game because there were no silences. You're constantly being entertained. You lose that bit time in between the pitches where all the strategy is going on. I don't like the Major League game. Yeah, well, let me Go tell ahead. you, let me tell you something. I was, once, I, I was asked not long ago... Uh, if Jackie Robinson were to come back today, what would he find most objectionable about the game? And there are the obvious things like the commercialization of it and the steroids and so forth. But one that was on my list that people don't think about is the one you've just raised. Professional baseball has now emulated what basketball did 15 years yep. ago. Noise. Yep. Using Total. the blaring of noise. Total. So I, 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 get, I gave up my season tickets for the Knicks because you couldn't have a conversation with the person no. sitting next no. to you. And no. now it's going to happen in baseball, too. It's horrible. With this noise. But there still is the capacity, if you're an active fan, if you're engaged in a conversation, at least with yourself, but maybe with those that are with you right. as well, and, and, and you can still do that at Yankee Stadium with the person that's sitting next to you and maybe the person sitting next to them, and certainly the person in front and behind. And... So what's going to happen on this pitch? Oh, yeah. Is, should we hit and run here? Right. All those right. conversations. Oh, yeah. That the, the more you get away from the finger sec exercises of, of, this, of understanding the sport and into the deep symphony of it, you, you, it, it, those are the very skills of the contemplative life, it turns out. Right. And this is something that we're losing in modernity. It's why I go into the Grand Canyon as well as to baseball games. We need to learn more to live slow. So, so the purpose of the course now is, is all four of those purposes, right, up mm -hmm. to 4.0. And, and if the students leave with nothing else, and it's interesting how many of them say that they leave with this, it's the skill of contemplation and noticing the small things. Ooh, talk about some of the words that I used in the beginning that I almost always mispronounced. And how does that relate to baseball? Well, Ineffable hierophany, et cetera. Go ahead. What, is, what does that mean? So, so what we do is we take tools that I used to use with my students to study the phenomena of religion. So we, they read things like Marcia Eliade, Rudolf Otto, Oh, God, William this is my James. reading list with so, you, too. So, 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 uh, so the word hierophany is a word that, that uh, Eliade uses, and it means literally in the Greek, the sacred shining through. So... When he defines the sacred, I mean, remember, we're studying the phenomena here. We're not being judgmental. Right. No, I get it. So, so when he defines the sacred, he says the sacred is that which is not profane. And the profane is that which is not sacred. So it's a completely circular and subjective definition. So now take this. I walk through the wonderful vastness of the outback in Australia. And I and my daughter, my son... Are, are, are with a native Australian guide. Now, the native Australian culture is the oldest continuous civilization in the world, 100,000 years. Their cave paintings predate Altamara by 70, 80,000 years. They can't even be carbon dated. So here's this wonderful guide walking through the outback, this vastness of flat. And suddenly in front of us there arises Uluru, what Westerners call Ayers Rock. This, this wonderful, everybody's seen at least a picture of this wonderful mm -hmm. orange mountain, especially in the sun, as a sunrise or sunset. And there it is, emerging, this monolith out of this outback. To him, this is Axis Mundi. This is what connects this plane with the, with, with, with the, the transcendent plane. It's, it truly is the, the pipe through which we move to another dimension. To me, it's a beautiful, natural artifact. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if we were to have with us a priest, and we were to stop there in the sacredness of that moment for him, and take out some bread and wine, and consecrate it, to us, that moment when the words of consecration were said, as, as Christians, 
would be transformative. They, they suddenly, this bread and wine would become the body and blood of the, right. of the Savior. For him, it's still something to eat after you get, right. hungry, you get hungry. Right. So here we have these two experiences. And, 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 and this is, is what the students can take away, that word hierophany, you see, then can be taken away and applied to baseball and to the novels we read about baseball. And then finally in the last two classes, uh, uh, Tom Oliphant, who worked with me on this book, and Doris Kern Goodwin, who wrote the foreword, and Pete Hamill, my colleague at NYU. Snow's in August. Uh, uh, Snow in August, which wow. the students read. So the three of them join me, and they've got four people who give testimony. This is what religious communities do. To the faith of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh, God. You know? and, 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 and they see the same dynamic of hierophany. Okay. And we claim that there is this ineffable experience. So, so this is important because you're at a research university, I'm at a research university. The claim in the book is that, yes, there is the known, which great universities impart. Right. And there's the knowable, which great universities like ours seek. You right. Know, expand and us, the kind right. of the, of the right. known. This is what we do in our lives, right? The knowable. And some of it we won't know for a thousand years or in ways different from the way we know. But then there is this third category. Right. The That's the claim right. of the book. The unknowable, which is ineffable. Right. It can't be put in our cognitive. That's the domain of religion and faith. That's your great love affair with your wife, my great love affair with my wife. This is the, that, 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 that can't be expressed in cognitive terms. You use that love, that, that intimacy with wife and, 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 and that bond, that transcendent bond. But what, what is transcendent? What is, what is beyond? Is there, is there consciousness in any way? Is, also, again, let me just rant a little bit. Your God, or the God of Paul Tillich, is not the God of St. Thomas the Apostle, Apostle, Archbishop Malloy, Brooklyn Prep, or St. Brendan's. So we're talking about a different God and a different, in a sense, way to get to it. Well, the, 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 the title of the book, remember, is Baseball uh, as a Road I get to it. God, not the Road right. to God. And I, you know, uh, I uh, married Lisa, who's Jewish and who wanted to raise our children Jewish. So, so our son Jed and our daughter Katie uh, are Jewish. And uh, Jed married an Italian Catholic who converted to Judaism, and their three children are Jewish. And you go to Mass every Sunday? I go to Mass, not every Sunday, oh, okay. but I go to, I go to Mass uh, frequently on Sunday, frequently during the week. Uh -huh. but, but, uh, but the. Uh, uh, the, the, the point is, my, my, my sister's husband, uh, my cousin Mike, my, my, my friend Mike Murray, who is, you, you, you know, right. as, yep. as, as a kind of cousin in the family, yep. uh, he says, not since Abraham has a Gentile begat as many Jews as I. So I'm the last one to put my religion in someone else's face. I haven't done it with my family. Right. So uh, I'm not going to claim Catholicism is the road or that there's any particular way to describe God. I will say my God is not an anthropomorphic God. M my uh, uh, life beyond is not green pastures. Right. Uh, much of the metaphor of religion is the sky above and uh, hell below and earth in the middle and heaven is in sky. And then as, 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 as time went on, we began to stop talking about God being up there and began to think of him being out there. And mm -hmm. then with Tillich, we talk about in God, God in here. And right. that's much closer to my, my, my notion. Now, there are questions that literally when asked literally can't be answered in cognitive terms. And one of them is, so describe it. Well, if the claim is that it's ineffable, then inherently can't. it can't be right. described. Okay. So we're into the domain of faith. It's not something of which I can convince an unbeliever, uh, but it's something that I can believe deeply and order my life around. So, as you know, Lisa died very suddenly six years ago, out of order, because she was 10 years younger Oof. than me. But I experience her presence and her love in my life daily. Right. And I have faith. That what? I have faith that there is continuation of that in a way that's meaningful to the two of us, that I can't Meaningful describe. to her, too. Yes. As a her. And there will be when I pass wow. this claim. But I hope. 
Yeah, well, it, it's Pascal's wager, as right. far as I'm concerned. You're, the, the, you're betting. Oh, yeah. I'm it's, not betting. I just wouldn't. It makes no sense to bet the other way. Right, right, because you lose. <laughs> right, I know. It's, it's game theory 101. Go ahead. So, you know, this is not, uh, this is not something that uh, is, is f for those that demand everything be reduced to a formula or to, to, to words we can comprehend. So it's, it's but it's something that can be deeply felt in the same way that love can be deeply felt but can't be proven. Right. Your wife did not reason you to the fact that, in fact, by every, every indicator, it would be unreasonable for her to love you. Well, yeah, in fact, there are many people have commented on that. Did you recognize it? <laughs> and that? the same would be true. Excuse me. That we both, well, we both uh, share the blessing of having, having married way above our heads. No, well, yeah, and, and, and hit the cosmic jackpot, both of us, and, and we knew each other. Okay, so it is a road to God. There are other roads to God. There's poetry, there's music, there's sunsets, there's the Grand Canyon. I so it's a way of obliquely looking at the world. Exactly. That's the lesson, I think, for the students. I, in fact, uh, this one of the readings that they do is uh, Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea. Oh, yeah. And I happen to be preparing for that class. They read, they read Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea, in which he says, I would, like to, I would like to fish, Santiago says to the boy. I would like to fish someday with the great DiMaggio. His father was a fisherman, you know. And then they read simultaneously uh, Gay Talese's great piece in The New Yorker about DiMaggio as an old man. Right. And, and there, there's this wonderful, there are two haunting lines in that piece about, about DiMaggio. One is when he's on his honeymoon with Marilyn Monroe in Japan. And the local uh, commander of the U.S. forces finds out that the Marilyn Monroe's there and asks her to come see the troops. And Joe says, oh, it's your honeymoon, you know, if you want to go, go. So she goes and she comes back. He says, how was it? She said, you wouldn't believe it, Joe. It was wonderful. There were 100,000 people cheering for me. You've never seen anything like it. And he says, <laughs> yes, yes, I, I have. have. Right. And then there's this one other scene, haunting as well, where, where Talese visits uh, uh, DiMaggio's older brother, uh, Vince. Yeah, sweet and brother. they used to say of the, of the DiMaggio brothers yeah. that, that Joe was the best hitter, Dom was the best fielder, right. and Vince was the best singer. And, 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 and he, he's up uh, north. He never went into the family fishing business. And he's up and he has a family. He's been married for decades. He's got grandchildren. And in his closet is one suit, a tailor-made suit made for Joe that Joe gave him and he's never had altered. Mm. And Talese says to him, are you jealous of Joe? And he says, maybe Joe would like to have what I have. Right. And the juxtaposition yep. of those Ooh, two, those two books, yeah. you know, and as I was deep sea fishing with my daughter and her fiance as I was preparing for that class. And, and here I had the normal experience of DiMaggio as the character and always Santiago and the boy, of course. But I also had the experience of fishing. And there's a way in which fishing is a contemplative story sure. too. But what it doesn't have that baseball has, and this is what baseball makes baseball unique in my, in my view, it's not only got the timelessness, it's not only got the contemplative uh, 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 moments, uh, as well as these ecstatic, ineffable sure. moments, like when that final out is made in 1955. But what baseball has too is this almost infinite kaleidoscope of variations and possibilities, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it's that I don't understand fishing, but I don't see it. No, fishing. it's not. No, I see many of the same qualities. No, and, and in fact, you don't, I, I don't see it in any other sport, including pro football, which is a very but keep in strategic mind, game. Keep in mind that this is what we as Catholics say about Buddhism. So it may well be we just don't understand it. Well, this, this very well may be the case. Before, we, before, let's move a little bit away from baseball to what you have called allergies. And you said it to Bill Moyers. What are, what are these allergies that you were talking about? You were talking about the, the, the changes you weren't particularly happy with in society, the direction of society. Well, well we, we've, as, especially in America, but it's, it's now given America's cultural dominance in the world, becoming more and more true around the world, we've developed a societal allergy to nuance and complexity. We, we, we love rankings. 
You know, I think U.S. News and World Report is going to put out a ranking of religions soon. Oh, it, yeah. It, you know, which one is... Yeah, but well, let's develop some criteria yeah, right here. Go that's ahead. That's right. Well, first of all, yours and mine will be number one. No, right? I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about yours. I might ain't. <laughs> but Go in ahead. any case, we, we love nice, simple answers. Our politicians speak in slogans. We, do, we don't like it when, 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 when they present us with complexity. And this this is not good. This is not good. Uh, and and it's a, it's it connects to the book in a way, because it comes from this this inability to see the intricate. We want everything to be in bold letters. This this we've created a hyper stimulated society mm -hmm. that that overvalues immediate gratification, mm -hmm. is unwilling to make sacrifice for for the future. Uh, and and it's 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 not for the good, and I think all of us who care about ideas and care, care about the depthness of of humanity uh, have to begin to push back. Yeah, and then you also in, as part in another conversation with uh, on CUNY TV with uh, Richard Hefner, you 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 call a society one of quantification, numerization, and the danger is that not all that is important can be measured, but what we measure becomes important. And this, this is a, a dangerous threat to education because what Charlie gave to me and what, what ultimately uh, uh, playing him to you, oh, gave absolutely. To you yeah. is, not, is not quantifiable. Right. I mean, now, now, we're an evidence-based society. I'm not saying do away with evidence. The, the analogy in baseball would be sabermetrics. Right. Okay? So you got to use it. Right. But it's it not the everything. Game. It it's ain't not, the game. You, you cannot capture Derek Jeter no. or, God forbid, Jackie Robinson. Right. In the statistics you can't. only. You can't. Not at all. Oh, John, it's wonderful. Always. Great, Doug. Good to see you. My thanks to friend John Sexton for being on the show. Join us next week when my guest will be Michael Moss, Pulitzer Prize winner and author of Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us, here on CUNY TV. Excellent, John. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.